Thanks, Bonnie, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, apologize for my voice. I've got a bit of a cold. I'll try to speak up. If I can't hear me in the back, wave, and I'll try to uh, increase the volume. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here um, and uh, to see all of you all here on a cold uh, Tuesday afternoon. Um, I'm going to try to speak for about an hour or so, a little bit less, I hope, uh, and then we'll have some time for questions and conversation. Uh, and then we'll be done by 5.30, so you can get on with uh, things. But um, again, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I am here in part representing uh, the co-authors in this project, uh, my partner and colleague at uh, Colby, Lynn Brown, and uh, our colleague Sharon Lamb uh, from the UMass, uh, who teaches now at UMass Boston. And uh, the three of us have written this book called Packaging Boyhood, and uh, I'm going to be you know, giving you some highlights uh, along the way and also talking about some implications of this work for uh, teaching boys, parenting boys, uh, working with boys uh, in general. And um, it's important to acknowledge that Lynn, Sharon, and I were all trained as developmental psychologists, um, but we really become kind of cultural critics, uh, amateur anthropologists, if you will, because as we have uh, worked together and work separately in the fields of education and human development and uh, Lynn and Sharon particularly in their work with girls. Um, we've uh, really come to think uh, about the importance of uh, understanding and exploring what we call, what I've called here the cultural landscape, the, the culture if you will in which both girls and boys are living, uh, are growing up and really understanding and looking at that, the dimensions of the culture is uh, we believe a critical uh, aspect of you know, teaching and learning and, and e perhaps even more critical than really looking uh, at the underlying psychological dimension. So um, this, the, this is from Newsweek, the boy crisis. Uh, many of you know there is a, certainly a con current contemporary concern about boys in schools, what's going on for boys in schools. Um, this may be a little bit overhyped to say that uh, at every level of education they're falling behind, but there is certainly something going on and and while many folks are trying to focus on understanding you know the, the psychology of boys um, this approach is a somewhat different one as I said to, to look at the culture uh, and to understand the, the, the cultural uh, dimensions and uh, media as Ani said is, a, is an important way to, to look at the culture to understand the impact of the media um, this is not a great uh, illustrative cartoon, if you will, but it's uh, trying to make the point that all of us are influenced by the media. And so as we go through this today, I want us, I mean, this is for myself and from all of us who are parents and teachers and grown-ups in the lives and in the worlds of boys, to understand that, that we're shaped by these same messages. Uh, we talked a little bit about this this morning, that, you know, that uh, boys are certainly influenced, but we're influenced as well. And, uh, you know, our assumptions, our expectations that we bring to our work with boys are shaped by these same messages, these same stereotypes. And so, um, while ultimately the focus of this work is to, for parents to help boys resist these stereotypes, uh, I think really, you know, we all have to work at that. And we all have to work at resisting these stereotypes, resisting these messages, understanding the limitations of, of these messages. Um, we looked at this slide uh, this morning as well. This is from a great project you can find on the web this pink and blue project by uh, this uh, artist, photographer. But um, th this it just captures uh, one of the dimensions of this uh, work, uh, which is how much gender has become commercialized. Um, this is certainly one of the things we argue has is, is changed over the last 20 years. Gender is much more uh, used in selling uh, marketing products, particularly to boys and girls. And this pink and blue thing is to indicate how much, uh, how strongly the message is that gender is separate, that boys and girls are different, that you know men are from Mars, women are from Venus, that whole thing, that you know that you can't cross these boundaries or these divides. Um, and in reality, that's not true. We know that, but um, you wouldn't know that necessarily at all from looking at the, the media. Um, this pink and blue stuff also raises the question uh, of you know the. the this nature and nurture question is, you know, are boys naturally drawn to blue? Are boys naturally drawn to all of these uh, 
uh, things that we're going to be talking about that sort of represent them in a particular way, or you know, is that a product of socialization? And the same for for um, girls. Uh, ultimately, the answer is certainly some mix of nature and nurture shapes boys and girls' actions and interactions and behaviors in the world. But um, I myself fall on the spectrum that suggests that you know, socialization, nurture, the, the way in which the, the cultural influences play out in boys' and girls' lives uh, is certainly exerts a very, very powerful influence. And so, um, you know, and we can talk about that uh, as we go. It always comes up in this kind of conversation. It's an important one, but um, this pink and blue um, illustrates that in a nice way. Uh, <coughs> this project on boyhood is actually a sequel to an earlier project on girlhood, Packaging Girlhood, uh, written by Sharon and Lynn uh, several years ago, looking at the way marketers in the media uh, convince girls about a, a certain image, set of images about being hot, being you know into shopping, co-opting girl power to be the power to alter their appearance and to you know, be hot and to fight other girls. Uh, very set of set of very limiting messages and stereotypes, and so we wanted to uh, undertake the same kind of exploration uh, in the lives of boys. As Lynn and Sharon went out talking about packaging girlhood, they always got the question, "What about the boys?" Uh, and so this uh, project was undertaken in that light, and uh, they invited me to join in. I've been teaching a course on boys and called Boys to Men, uh, Boys Development and Education for a number of years, and um, so I was, uh, it was a pleasure to, to join into this project. And uh, like uh, Packaging Girlhood, <coughs> the, the representation of all this is framed around sort of five categories. Um, what boys wear, and again these were the same categories for the, the girl project, so what boys wear, what they watch, movies and TV, etc., what they hear, the music they listen to, as well as kind of what messages they hear uh, in their everyday world, uh, what they read, books, magazines, um, what they play and do. These are both kind of sports and actual, you know, games out in the playground, et cetera, as well as internet, uh, video games, uh, et cetera. And um, we gathered information initially by way of an online survey, kind of distributed it virally. Uh, to trying to target boys ages 4 to 18 um, from you know, as many different parts of the country as we could. Uh, it's not a systematic attempt, uh, but we um, put together this online survey and, and got it out as far as we could. Parents helped some younger boys fill this out. And we asked them about their favorite media in those five categories. You know, what do you like to wear? What's your favorite T-shirt say? What are your favorite brand of sneakers? You know, what are you listening to? What's your favorite music? What's your band? What song is going through your head right now? You know, what do you watch? Uh, what do you like to do and play? And we use that to guide us into our own exploration. So again, this is not a reporting of of the number of boys who said this and that and the other thing. This is we use the boys as our informants to point us in the direction. Uh, to then, um, you know, we went to back to the malls and talked to the clerks and read the magazines and, you know, watched the movies and the TV shows and listened to the music, played the video games to do our own analysis. But the boys, um, again, were the starting point for this. Um, we did not, we don't claim that we've covered everything by any means, uh, but we've tried to get a sense of the boys' world and the way the media and marketers present it. Uh, boyhood to boys, um, and we found sort of in general that um, you know the the version of boyhood that was up for sale these days is rougher, more arrogant, sort of more sophomoric, if you will, than anything that's marketed to girls. So there's definitely a, a set of messages that are being um, packaged to boys about how to be a particular kind of boy. Um, we took all the stuff and did a thematic analysis, looking for patterns and themes. We also paid particular attention to the tools that marketers use to sell products to boys and actually to sell products to all of us. Whoops. Um, and talking about this this morning a bit, the, the notion of anxiety and the way marketers use anxiety is a key 
element in all this, and it's it's uh, something that ties directly into, as I'll, we'll see, a number of key issues in boys' lives. Um, so marketers try to increase your anxiety that you don't measure up, that you're not good enough, that you're not strong enough, that you're not pretty enough, you're not popular enough, um, by you know presenting a model of somebody who is that way and make you feel you know that you are fall short of that and then they try to sell you a product that are supposed to help you measure up to be that way in one way or another to be prettier to be stronger to be tougher uh, to be more manly in this case and you know that's intended to reduce your anxiety but um, in the process it increases anxiety and boys one of the characteristics of being a boy is to grow up with a very, from a very early point in your life of feeling anxious about uh, a number of things and this sense of sort of measuring up to feeling that you're, are you or are you not a real boy? And so this um, sense of anxiety, fear, and exploitation of that, or an exploitation of that anxiety and fear, um, you know, comes across in a variety of ways. And so here's, <coughs> we looked again at this this morning, uh, a couple, these are the kind of the prototypical examples of this. These are sw Old Spice Swagger ads. Um, there's L, L Cool J on the left, uh, who's a rap star, and Brian Erlacher on the right, uh, linebacker for the uh, Chicago Bears. And in both cases, um, you know, the, the picture is of uh, the anxiety, right? The, the, the picture here of LL Cool J, you know, kind of both of these are effeminate. We were talking about this with the on his class this morning, um, clearly kind of photoshopped to you know bring out the kind of effeminate features, the high cheekbones, the lips, etc. Um, they don't you know the, the skinny arms, etc. And uh, the idea here is that you know this product, Old Spice, you know makes you uh, a real man. So in this case, old, uh, Brian Erlacher says Old Spice Swagger transformed me from this sad little nerd person into the colossal man mountain of awesomeness that you see now. You know, thanks, Old Spice. And LL Cool J says, with Old Spice Swagger, I'm doing it and doing it and doing it well. Before Swagger, I was doing it and doing it and doing it just OK. You know, thanks, Old Spice, says LL Cool J. So in both of these cases, the fear is that they don't, you know, not measuring up, not a real boy, they're, you know, the, and the, the classic put-downs for boys are, you know, you're a wuss, you're a girl, you're, uh, you know, you, you, you're a wimp, a uh, nerd, whatever. Uh, but here is a selling of a particular kind of power, not just here, but in lots of other ways, you know, selling a tough, fearless, uh, hyper-heterosexual uh, acts in the upper right corner axis, as we'll see, um, you know, notorious for overdoing this, uh, the hyper-masculine sense of, of masculinity. And so <coughs> this, again, is, is one of the ways that anxiety plays out and is, is used by marketers to, um, you know, sell products, and we saw this over and over again. Um, this ties in to uh, the sense that a number of commentators have suggested that we live in an era of anxious mas masculinity, kind of a post-9-11 era. This is the G.I. Joe kind of character that started out, uh, you know, as kind of a normal guy, and then in the 90s became pumped up and hyped up, and, um, you know, now has become, in the recent movie, you can't really see it, but just kind of a completely hyper-buffed, uh, you know, killing machine in a sense. Um, and so there is that anxiety that's out there about masculinity, and you know, a number of folks have commented on the, the, the way in which the, the, the Bush uh, image right after the, war, the Iraq war, as it was supposedly, you know, the mission was supposedly accomplished, um, was a you know, hyper-masculine representation of military masculine might. Um, certainly there's economic anxiety these days. Of, you know, the more men have lost jobs than women. Um, and so the, 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 this, the point I'm trying to make here, and I want to go into great detail about this, is that um, this cultural sense of masculine anxiety connects, we think, to the marketer's use of anxiety as a technique to sell products. And so it just it, it exacerbates uh, you know, a complicated situation on the part of 
both boys and men. Um, and <clears throat> it shows up in interesting ways. So here's a toy, uh, Target toy catalog. Came to our house, came to probably many of your houses uh, before Christmas this fall. And, you know, it's interesting. So, again, we looked at this this morning. Um, there's the, the boy in the background. So he's the one who's freaked out, who's anxious, who's upset, uh, because we assume it's his sister uh, who's in her, you know, pink shirt and her princess uh, tiara uh, playing with Barbie. And you don't know who this is? Recognize that? Oh, but that's a transform Optimus, Optimus Prime, right? <laughs> Not just a transformer, but the prime transformer, right? So, you know, how could you, I mean, you know, and so Bar and this is the pink and blue Legos, and we decided this is the representation of a church bells and a minister, so there's clearly a wedding ceremony happening, and Optimus is <laughs> either uh, willingly or unwillingly being married off to Barbie, um, but it clearly violates from the boy's point of view, a number of important things. Uh, and um, again, it's, it's just an interesting capturing of, of this sense of anxiety and that also the, the crossing of the gender divide, right? How could this possibly be, uh, be happening? So I um, don't want to make too much of that, but it's, it's an interesting uh, moment. So in any case, what I want to do now is to take you through uh, some of the key themes uh, that we found sort of across these various forms of media, these various dimensions of what boys are wearing and doing and listening to and watching, uh, and to, again to highlight ultimately some of the messages, the key messages that boys are getting and that in fact we're all getting about boys and boyhood uh, in the contemporary world. And this is really, again, I should say, obviously this is based, this is analysis just done in the U.S. based on, you know, the, over the last couple of years. So. Um, we, had a, we got into a conversation this morning a little bit about how this stuff may or may not be uh, playing out in other cultures these days, Europe, et cetera, but um, this is you know, US-based uh, at the moment. Um, this notion of over the top, the primary theme we, that we saw across all boys' media was this sense of over the top. Um, <clears throat> boys are bombarded with stereotypes about what it means to be a boy uh, including uh, messages about violence, toughness, and aggression. It just has to be, you know, bigger and more and hyper. And, you know, from world wrestling to fighting to MTV to the 300 movie to Spider-Man, you know, the, the violence uh, is over the top and just, you know, more and more uh, graphic and more and more uh, extensive. And while you know, people have been concerned about violence for a number of years and thinking about boys, many years, and Bonnie indicated that. And we're concerned about it too. That's not the only place you see this over the top uh, message. It's also in action films where, you know, you see car crashes and multiple car crashes, and it's not just cars crashing into each other, it's cars crashing into helicopters and, you know, <laughs> exploding buildings. and. Obviously, this is special effects and the use of computer-generated technology, which makes this all possible. But um, you know, again, it's it's a it's a bombarding of boys and the I mean, boys and girls, whoever's watching these films. But the assumption is that you know these explosions, these actions, these these over-the-top uh, you know, expressions are primarily directed at boys. Uh, they show up in video games, from video games to young kids. This Batman, Lego Batman video game in the corner. Parents raised a lot of concern about that uh, because of the violence directed to a, at a, in a video game directed to fairly young boys. Two, you know, Grand Theft Auto, and this is the 50 Cent um, video game, and, um, you know, the sense is that boys get into video games and, you know, they just, you know, it's, it's um, completely uh, over the top and, and absorbing in lots of ways. Um, we'll come back to talk about video games in a little bit. Um, it starts very early <coughs> with the toys that boys are encouraged to buy. Uh, action figures, if you walk through a you know, toy aisle of Walmart or Target or, or Toys R Us, um, you know, these, these, 
There's the WWE again, action figures on the left. The ruthless aggression. You've got to start, you pay, pay attention to the words. You know, ruthless aggression, adrenaline. Um, you know, there's a hyper laser blaster. Uh, here's the Mach 5 Big Sounds car. You know, it's a huge car. Uh, the Spider Man um, uh, fists. Uh, excuse me, uh, Hulk fists, sorry. Hulk fists with the Spider Man outfit. Uh, and uh, somebody was telling us this morning that those fists are, have, have built in uh, sound effects. So if you, when you hit them, what do they say? So, who is it? Oh, smash. Smash. Yeah, smash or pow or boom or ouch or something. So they're intended to be you know, used. And again, it's this sense of uh, over the top, bigger, um, and, and more and more uh, hyper, all, you know, fast and furious. Um, when I was growing up, Nerf was the pacifist alternative. You know, played the Nerf basketball, put it in the hoop, you had a Nerf ball, wouldn't hurt anybody. This Nerf is now into blasters and, um, you know, end strike Vulcan EB-25 blasters. Uh, and if you go through the toy aisle, Nerf products are guns now. They're, they're soft bullets, I assume, that go into the <laughs> cartridges, but there's, you know, it's no longer the just little uh, safe balls. Um, and <clears throat> when I was a kid playing with Hot Wheels and, you know, race tracks, where the, the key was to try to keep the car on the track, right? <laughs> now you have a fireball raceway with nine crash zones. <laughs> the, the point is to crash as many times as you can, in this case nine, uh, <laughs> at least. So, again, it's, it's a it's a different set of messages about, you know, violence, crashing. Um, Lego is another uh, example. Um, Lego used to be about creativity, and you still you can still buy the you know, blue and the uh, pink Lego boxes. But a lot of Lego is now about, um, again, sort of building these massive machines uh, that, um, you know, impose a kind of violent storyline on. On boys playing with Legos. So, um, message, boys get in this sense of over the top, they get a kind of mixed message that you're in control, but you're out of control. And uh, we listened to commercials on uh, Saturday morning cartoons, and that was kind of the theme that came through that, you know, that you can be in control, you're in charge, you're the, the one that makes this happen, but, you know, part of this is also just kind of going crazy. Um, be wild, crazy, out of control. Um, here's back to the same uh, catalog that I mentioned a minute ago. This is a really interesting page. <laughs> Gifts that inspire good behavior. And there are lots of interesting messages. What does that mean about boys? What does it mean to inspire good behavior? Why do boys need their behavior, I mean, to have good behavior inspired them. This, you certainly never see this for girls. But then what are the toys that are here? Right, there's Nerf again, by the way. That's a different Nerf. And then we have laser tag, we have Spider-Man, we have a Transformer, and then here's, you know, here's the face of this kid. And com compare that face to, you know, this face. You know, it's just, um, and it's this sort of over-the-top sense of, you know, everything that's here uh, is, um, and I suppose there are, these look like little farm animals maybe, although there's Buzz Lightyear and, you know, but the key thing is the, this sort of Spider-Man outfit and the, and the web blaster juxtaposed vis-a-vis -vis him. Um, what do you notice about the books? Can't see the title. Can't see the title of the books, you know. They are they are taking up at least space that's in the middle of the picture, not right at the end, but, you know, it's clear that uh, reading books doesn't have anything to do with good behavior. I don't know what does in this exactly, but it's, again, a really interesting set of messages to, to boys and to parents uh, about, you know, what boys want, what boys, um, you know, what toys you buy for boys. Um, Another dimension of the over-the-top, this is for some of the older boys now, is risk-taking. Um, 
you know, the Jackass uh, MTV series has spawned some films and some takeoffs, and um, it's, you know, the, this kind of early out of control stuff that we looked at a minute ago now prepares the way for other ways of being out of control, for, of being over the top, of being wild and crazy in terms of risk taking. Uh, they can be stupid as long as they're extraordinary. This is backyard wrestling here on the bottom, um, you know, inspired by the world wrestling and entertainment. Um, and one of the things we're struck over and over again throughout all of this, and this is another key thing to keep in mind, is that the way messages that are sort of, you would assume are intended or directed toward adolescent boys are making their way to in the world of younger and younger boys, um, like the sexualized imagery that we'll talk about a little bit. But this is an example of the you know, kind of risk taking that is clearly adolescent in its origin, you know, gets, gets filtered down younger and younger. Uh, another thing that we looked at uh, in more detail than we assumed we would was uh, energy drinks. Um, this is a phenomenon that's you know, hit the market in a big way in the last 10 years or so. And here again, you just sort of have to start, you know, listen to the, the names. Full throttle, no fear, adrenaline rush, assault, monster, tiger, red bull, rock star, amp, pimp juice. You know, here's amp, tall boy, big rig. Um, you know, and it's, uh, it's over the top. And it, it almost, when you started to really look at this, it started to seem, uh, it seemed to us a bit uh, desperate, even frantic. Um, like a sort of reaction formation that they're, you know, there's, you know, that, you know, you're protesting a little bit too much, or you're, you know, trying to pump up a little bit too much. Or, you know, what's what's behind this? What's the fear? What's the anxiety underneath this? Um, and <clears throat> a lot of this is uh, when you go to the websites, and boys are directed to the websites of these energy drinks. As, as a, to, you know, you folks, a lot of you folks know, you know, this is the way the the websites represent both rock star and monster. And again, this is the uh, you know, bigger, better, faster, stronger, um, incredible energy boost to those who lead a active and exhausting rock lifestyles. Or monster is you know, this double shot of our killer energy brew, twice the buzz, packs a vicious punch. Um, and you know, again, the, the, the message again and again is you, you do more and more. Uh, Monster has an army. on the, You can join the Monster Army on the website, uh, move up the ranks. But to do that, one of the ways to do that is to upload videos of yourself kind of doing wild and crazy things. So it, it reproduces and, and reinforces this message. Uh, reading, a lot of concern about boys and reading. Um, so even what boys read, from books for little boys through comic books and graphic novels to magazines, has an over-the-top feel to it. Um, and, and so again, you know, you start to look at the magazines, and this is directed to sort of young men. You know, XXL, Maxim, Giant. You know, and then my big rig. This is Manga Macbeth. Uh, <laughs> you know, a, a manga, or, you know, graphic novel, comic book kind of series of Shakespeare that's. Uh, some folks, particularly in England, are using to kind of entice boys into reading. Um, but um, uh, wealth, uh, an another way to live over the top is to have a lot of money. Um, and so these sort of role models of men who have lots of money, who have, you know, money, 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 uh, bling, you know, all of that, it's, it's not... Uh, necessarily through hard work, um, but it's sort of being knowing how to be tough and how to play people and play the game and win. Um, girls are encouraged to shop. Boys are encouraged to spend. Um, you know, here's the, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins. Uh, the guy with the power is the guy with money to burn. Uh, materialism is uh, sold to boys in lots of different ways, a version of cool that requires Technology, fa fashion, money, etc. cetera. Um, so, skipping through some of these fairly quickly. Sports is another area where over the top uh, extreme uh, is everywhere, whether it's extreme sports or the most vicious, violent hits uh, in the college <coughs> of professional football to the, uh, you know, the biggest crashes in NASCAR. Um, you know, the world's best athletes are celebrated. Um, 
in lots of uh, ways. Um, and the world's best athletes can, you know, fall from their pedestal um, <laughs> as well. Um, we have a, actually, there's, we have, we did write a lot about role models and we didn't, you know, obviously we didn't write about Tiger, but uh, it's an interesting uh, dimension of the way in which role models, male role models in particular in the media are, you know, either live up to that role or, or don't uh, and the impact and the effect it has on boys in particular. Um, winning, you know, winning is everything. Nobody remembers second place. Michael Phelps was celebrated for his accomplishments uh, last summer, summer before last. Uh, nobody remembers the, the name of the Serbian swimmer uh, who you know, finished that so close to Phelps in that 100-yard butterfly. Um, but, uh, you know, the, again, the message is that um, winning, being number one, is uh, the key. Be being bigger is always better. There's 50 cent. Whether it's bodies or guns, the biggest gun is best, the biggest biceps, the biggest, you know, the most cut abs. Um, uh, you know, that, that message is all through boys' media. And it uh, connects to the superhero image. Uh, and the concern, I mean, superheroes are everywhere. Um, and certainly there's lots to admire in superheroes, but, um, you know, we worry that a lot of the message that superheroes are given is that, uh, or that the, the message that superheroes carry is that power uh, can be an excuse for violence. Um, you know, uh, certainly the, we looked at comic books and the, the superhero image has changed and been reshaped in recent years. Uh, there's more of a blurring uh, of the lines between good and evil. Um, and, uh, you know, the, that they're not as uh, pure, certainly in lots of ways, as they used to be. Um, superheroes <coughs> send a, another kind of message about anxiety. This is uh, this message about vulnerability, uh, fears that boys and men are, are weak. Again, not uh, measuring up that there's something that's you know going to bring me down. Uh, but the vulnerability in the superhero genre has to be hidden has to, to be defended against, uh, has to be avoided at all costs. Um, it can't really be embraced or acknowledged or worked through. It has to be just kind of kept at, kept at bay. Um, and the other piece of this, uh, in terms of many of the, the vulnerabilities of superheroes, is that it's tied to relationships often. Um, you know, the way to get to the superhero is to get to somebody he loves. Uh, and um, that Again, we worry is, is a kind of message that, that boys may take in to say, well, you know, I'm not going to let myself be vulnerable through relationships. Um, and that's, you know, that's not a message that's ultimately going to be very productive for boys. Uh, another thing that's new is these padded artificial muscles uh, that you see in boys' Halloween costumes, superhero costumes. <coughs> and sure, it's fun to be able to identify with and look like your favorite superhero. But it also sends a message that to be a real superhero, to be a real man, you have to look a certain way, buffed, chiseled, muscle bound. And there's increasing concern about boys' body image, <coughs> concerns about boys having concerns and, and worries about body image and uh, not only eating disorder, but other kinds of sort of um, over the top um, muscle building and working out and et cetera. And, and there's not a direct, we don't argue that there's a direct link or direct cause and effect between these, the appearance of these costumes and <coughs> those concerns, but, um, <coughs> you know, it's, it's an important part of the, the current cultural landscape that's absolutely worth talking about with boys. Um, here's another, <coughs> excuse me, example of this uh, thing I mentioned earlier about how these messages that are directed to older boys um, start to filter down into little boys. So superhero movies and uh, the best, uh, most, I mean, the, the clearest example of this is the recent um, Dark, Dark Knight there in the middle. You know, a lot of folks thought that should have been R-rated actually because of the violence, because of the torture, etc. It was it had a PG-13 rating and here's the 
official um, Motion Picture Association of America uh, description of a PG-13 rating. Uh, it goes beyond the PG rating in terms of violence, nudity, sensuality, language, adult activities, uh, drug use, harsher uh, sexually derived words, etc. Um, but what happens in, in this case, and in, in that particular case, is that there was a you know a very uh, extensive marketing campaign directed toward little boys for lots of products related to the Dark Knight. So Battelle introduced and marketed a new bat seat, new vehicles, action figures, weapons, games, etc. And there are cartoon uh, advertisements directed to boys in the shows they watch, the cartoons, etc. And so boys are encouraged, and you know what they are um, sold is the importance of going to see this movie. Um, and when they get there, they find that you know, in fact, it's may be, in many cases, much more violent, much more scary, much more, you know, more than they really can take. And so, again, this is a way in which they're impacted and affected. And um, Sharon Lamb is a clinical psychologist, and so she's uh, focused a, a good bit of her attention on the trauma that may result uh, from exposure in these movies, for example, to these kinds of things. Um, these over-the-top explosions, crashes, murders, you know, deaths, injuries, and um, you know, it doesn't happen in every case. But um, one of the things that we write a little bit about is this reversal of uh, fear, uh, kind of I'm not scared, I can take it, um, and uh, they can't they don't, can't show that they're not they're afraid. Um, in fact, have to prove that they aren't scared, aren't a baby, and so. Um, again, this, you know, the, the, that's not healthy, and it may also suggest that um, this kind of violence primes boys to express more violent feelings um, over and over. So, um, this need to be the best crosses all genres of boys' media, but there is an alternative. And if you can't be the best, uh, you can be a slacker. And the uh, sort of ubiquitous nature of the slacker image, the slacker stereotype, was something else that surprised us. Uh, this is a safe face alternative to the humiliated position that a boy might occupy if he can't compete or is afraid to compete to be the best. Um, it's a kind of I don't care about winning or performing well attitude. And in that way, it's again, it's a defense against anxiety through humor, through a kind of self deprecation and saying, you know, I don't care about that. I'm going to just, uh, you know, slack off and not care. Uh, this Diary of a Wimpy Kid series is very popular. I'm sure the folks in schools know that. And, you know, that there's an appeal to both boys and girls in that. Uh, and it's, you know, it's funny and, uh, you know, there's, you know, it's cleverly drawn and written, etc. But, you know, in the end, that's a story of a slacker who tries to kind of get through without doing uh, as much as he could in life, and that's, you know, a, a, a worrisome message. So they don't typically don't study or read or have ambitions, in, except perhaps to be a rock star in the case of Jack Black. Uh, they never try to please authority figures. Uh, Bart Simpson was one of the early slackers. Uh, Simpsons are now celebrating their 20th year or their, uh, you know, so he's been around a long time. Bart is an example of part of the slacker image, which you can you know, it allows a boy to poke fun at the pumped up hypermasculine dudes, uh, the one who think they're so hot but aren't. But um, to the way the slacker thing has played out is that, you know, it's, it's funny and it's intended to be, but it's so pervasive and it starts so young that boys don't really get the chance to develop the perspective needed to understand the humor or the irony in the slacker image. Uh, and so, um, you know, don't really understand that the this, these are some examples of things that are intended to be taken, you know, not taken seriously. And it's tied to uh, lots of other anti-school messages that boys get in their books, in their media. Uh, they get the message that, uh, you know, school is for girls, boys hate school, slackers hate school. Um, you know, you need a day off, like Ferris Bueller, from time to time just to get through. Um, and again, there's not an absolute cause and effect here, I'm not arguing that, but those who are concerned 
from that first slide about the boy crisis, um, uh, we would say it's worth paying attention to the uh, impact of this slacker image on some of that. It's tied to lots of over-the-top humor for boys that, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's nothing really wrong with this except, again, it's, it, um, you know, sends a message that boys are only into a certain kind of uh, over-the-top, stinky, nasty, gross-smelling, disgusting kind of things. Um, and, um, you know, spoofs are funny again as well, and, but to be really, to really spoof things, you've got to be over the top like Bruno or, you know, South Park, um, and it sort of connect to that stereotype as well. Um, so, uh, a couple of other quick stereotypes, and then we'll get to a discussion of some of the things that parents and teachers can do in response to this. Um, we had kind of hoped that the media... Um, might represent boys' friendships in a positive way as a kind of saving grace. Um, and we know that real boys form friendships based on mutual interests. Um, but in the media, unfortunately, even for little boys, even in, uh, you know, animated movies, um, you know, friendships are represented in a very, very limited stereotypical way. And so we looked at some of the most popular animated movies that included uh, you know, friendships, uh, this is open season, this is surf's up, and unfortunately, again, you find uh, this bromance, this connection between boys is, is facilitated largely by kind of wild and crazy troublemaking uh, and pseudo drinking, uh, kind of gross stuff, again, farts, burps, vomit, um, dares and competition, you know, are you man enough, again, that sort of um, trying to one-up each other, uh, bullying as a way to connect to each other, Sexualization of girls. Uh, how many times do you hear in even cartoons or shows for young boys that, you know, some reference to a hot girl? Loyalty test, bros before does, that's in um, open season. Uh, bonding through revenge. Um, so, again, not really very positive messages ultimately about friendship in these, message, these movies directed to little boys. Uh, for teens, you know, here's um, Superbad and, you know, lots of, uh, again, other, um, you know, messages that aren't terribly positive in terms of partying and the hot girls and you just do it. You know, Superbad in the end has, I think, a nice kind of sweet message about boys' friendship and intimacy, but you have to get through an awful lot of this other stuff to get there, right? And, you know, maybe that's the assumption that you have to, Boys will only get the message if they sit through the rest of it, but or they they're you know drawn in by the rest of it. But you know it's a shame in lots of ways. Um, uh, real drinking, not just the um, the uh, energy drinks, but drinking in teens and in, in focusing on teens is is a source of male bonding. Um, this is from the. Um, Kid Nation, the CBS show a couple years ago that put kids in a, uh, their own ghost town and they had a saloon where the kids could kick back and enjoy root beer or a shot of ginger ale at the end of a hard day. So they weren't really drinking alcohol, but you know, the analog just analogy it was very, very clear. Um, so it's, it's marketed to boys from a very young age. Um, and <clears throat> there's one final stereotype, which is the player. Um, and this is the, the stereotype in film, TV, you know, across the board, that the assumption is that boys and men are obsessed with girls and women. So this is a heterosexual, you know, um, blatant, uh, you know, hyper-heterosexual image, uh, eager to dive into sex with total enthusiasm whenever, wherever, with whomever, as opportunities arise. And from Nickelodeon's Drake and Josh to, um, you know, uh, Two and a Half Men to, again, to Superbad, you know, that image, that image of the player is everywhere. Um, and it starts very early. So here's an Abercrombie and Fitch t-shirt, but here are some t-shirts for younger boys. Um, there's the Playground Pimp. Here's the Bachelor Plaid playset from... Uh, you know, the, inspired by the Dixie Pixar movie, Cars, 
uh, in the end, this this is a you know a place for the the Steve, the Lightning McQueen car to get cleaned up and whatever. But the bachelor pad image, uh, even though boys may not know exactly what that means or what that implies, is is a way that this is marketed uh, to boys. And um, across the board, this the object uh, you know as boys get older in much of their media. Uh, from the time they start wearing deodorant to the time uh, they're shopping for their own clothes is you find this these images of girls and women as objectified as you know pleasing uh, you know intended to please uh, boys and men sexual fantasies from again Axe to Abercrombie and Fitch um, and uh, you find it in music um, in rap videos and music videos and the lyrics in uh, the videos that my daughter listened to in her junior high dances the last several years. Um, and um, you find these sort of the everyday pornographic images. Uh, this again is Axe on the left, the Boom Chicka Wawa girls. Um, there's Axe again. Axe is a you know, uh, great source of lots of these negative images. Uh, interestingly, well, um, come back to that. Um, you know, the everyday porn and video games, the Grand Theft Auto. This uh, is actually a video game from Japan, Rate Play, that was banned uh, when parents found it on Amazon because it actually is a video game where you simulate sexual assault. Uh, and it didn't get, you know, it didn't get widely distributed, but it's an example of the kind of thing that's out there. Um, and back to novels, and back to graphic novels, and back to the way in which novels and graphic novels and manga are being used more and more to encourage uh, boys to read. A lot of them, you know, in, rely on very objectified, uh, very sexually, uh, you know, provocative images of women in particular as part of their cover art, as part of the, the you know, the art throughout them. And, um, to the psychological research just for a minute to suggest that in a couple different studies, uh, for both uh, men and women exposure to rap music videos that contain images of women in subordinate roles, that leads to greater acceptance of teen dating violence and uh, in general, frequent television viewing and pop music exposure leads to greater acceptance of sexual harassment. Uh, these two studies suggest again that these this objectification that emerges from this image of men as, and boys as players um, is, you know, has consequences on attitudes that you know, are really unhealthy. <clears throat> we have to acknowledge in all of this that in spite of the concern for the limiting and negative messages that the media is giving to boys about being a boy and about masculinity, you know, the reality is still that male privilege, male power, uh, is also, um, you know, a central part of this. And so even though they sell out, they limit, they constrain real boys in so many ways, boys and men are privileged and centered uh, in the media. There's um, Brett Michaels um, in the middle of his harem. And, um, <laughs> you know, the data hold, you know, support this, that 75% uh, of characters in the top grossing G-rated films from 1990 through 2004 are male. That continues. We used to take our daughter to the movies and all the popular movies and we'd sort of play a game. So, you know, find the girl in the lead characters and it's very hard to do from, you know, Shrek to Ice Age to, you know, Harry Potter. I mean, they're, they're, are, they're there, but the, the key, the main characters, the key characters, uh, you know, are always boys and it's at least you know a four to one uh, five to one ratio in, in virtually any movie directed to kids and the assumption is that that boys will not go to movies where girls are the main characters but girls will go to movies when boys are the main characters and and so that just reproduces that male privilege uh, male characters dominate most of the award-winning um, and popular books particularly anything that have to do with action competition and power um, and uh, so just some summaries of, of uh, as I try to move quickly around here, that, you know, in many ways, in spite of, I mean, with acknowledging, of course, the male privilege piece of this, boys are still sold out, sold out in the media, 
They're encouraged to live over the top, to be tough, violent, and aggressive, to seek revenge if humiliated, to take risks, to be in control. Uh, and if they can't sort of be the best, they can act funny, dumb, pretend not to care, be a slacker. And all of those messages are sell, or you know, we think are selling out real boys. Um, what we wish is that the media um, represented real boys with real feelings, other than anger and over-the-top excitement, uh, the, that the media showed the vulnerability, the sensitivity, the emotional complexity of real boys' lives, that boys' friendships, real friendships with other boys or girls that are based on relational intimacy and, and connection are present. Um, a great movie in that regard is Stand By Me, which is now a number of years old, based on a Stephen King novel about boys in Maine, but that's a great uh, movie that actually shows boys, teenage boys, 12-year-old boys, um, exhibiting real friendship with other boys based on real relational intimacy. Um, parents who are involved in boys' lives, uh, we wish media encourage more self-reflection on the part of boys. Uh, we wish media represented a wider range of diversity, both in terms of, uh, in terms of how you can be a boy, <coughs> multiple masculinities, uh, and we wish, you know, that what's missing is media representing that academic achievement is in fact cool and okay for boys to, to do. So, um, the last chapter of the book is uh, suggestions about, uh, we've been titled Rebel, Resist, Refuse, how do you help your sons, help the boys in the, your lives uh, resist these messages, uh, and we believe it's, you know, the, it's not about turning off your TV, it's not about unplugging the internet, it's really about conversation and dialogue and ongoing uh, interaction where the media literacy and critical consciousness raising can occur at home, in the classroom, in the everyday life of boys, um, you know, over and over and over again. So. Um, this model, a three-step model of uh, what Lynn and Sharon initially called reality-based parenting in packaging girlhood is, is the suggestion that we uh, offer. I've got a handout that has some of this on this, so we, I can give you that at the end. Um, the reality is that you can't shut the world off, can't completely protect your son or daughter, your daughter from the media and marketer's influence, so you have to take these steps, which is First of all, and most important, to do your own work as a parent, as a teacher, to explore the media on your own, to know what's uh, out there, to you know, listen to the music, to watch the TV shows and the movies, to play the video games, to you know, really know yourself uh, what's there, how you feel about it, and also to kind of be aware and be self-reflective about your own the way in which you take in, are influ take in and are influenced by these stereotypes and messages. So you've got to do your own work, uh, do your own homework. Then you have to talk to and listen to your, uh, your boy, your son, or the boys in your, your life about what he likes, why he likes it, uh, to get to know his world from his own perspective, why he's you know, enthralled by that particular video game. One of the things you may discover is that um, <coughs> You know, you may assume that he is enthralled by the video game because he likes the violence that he can enact in it. But you may find out that in fact it's the storyline that's driving the video game that is most appealing to him, because that's the case for many of the most of the most popular video games have a storyline that progresses through the levels, and it's it can be and it is for many boys as engaging, uh, if not more engaging than the violence. Um, and then once. You've done your work once you really heard him out, then you can really have the conversation. You can bring uh, your perspective, your, your, you know, you can bring your perspective into dialogue with his. Uh, you can help him understand uh, sort of the broader view, your own values, why you think these things are problematic, um, and, but you also you know, can appreciate his perspective. And uh, you can sort of engage in this ongoing process of media literacy, consciousness raising, that, that has to start, though, not from a position of, you know, let's turn this all off, but a position of let's, let's really talk about this. Um, we asked the boys in our survey, what's your advice for parents who <coughs> want to talk to you about your media? And they gave us some very wise advice. 
Um, here's just some, uh, sort of some snippets of that advice. Um, calmly. <laughs> just sit down and talk. You know, don't scream. No yelling. Kind of man to man, or you know, father. Um, you know, don't get frustrated. Don't rush into it. Let the kid do the talking. Uh, remember what it felt like to be a teenager. Be open and honest. Um, and you know, that was a great, that's a great advice for parents, for teachers. Um, you know, it's so easy to be so offended or so appalled that you, you know, just uh, you know, kind of go off. Uh, and that, say, boys, uh, is not productive. Um, we, uh, in the book, we give uh, suggestions for different ages, younger boys, uh, school-age boys, preteen, teenagers, of the kinds of things to talk about, the kinds of things to engage in. This is just a sample of those. Uh, <clears throat> we encourage uh, media literacy at home to start very early to introduce the stereotype, the S word, the, stereo the notion of stereotype to boys, uh, children very early. Um, they get it, they understand uh, that you know, stereotypes are not real and that they represent a certain you know, artificial uh, characterization that appears again and again and once you point it out and keep using it, they'll, they'll get it and understand it. Um, you can use marketers' own techniques to kind of beat them at their own game. You can ratchet up excitement for the things that you want for him rather than the things the marketers want. Uh, take back the language of choice and freedor, freedom that marketers use by connecting it to things you value. Marketers use this notion that you have a choice, it's your choice, you should be able to choose this and that. Uh, they sell that to kids and then they make parents be the bad guys in that. But if you take it and use it yourself, then you're sort of undermining that. Um, and you can, again, teach him about marketing, um, of the pervasive intent of marketing, you know, find the lie or find the product uh, in the advertisement game. There are lots of ways you can, again, just sort of raise awareness. Um, you can widen possibilities uh, from this blue and pink, either or, boy versus girl, to say, you know, a range of possibilities and options. Uh, and then you can keep at it as your son grows older. Um, this is a key one to have a, a real conversation, an ongoing conversation about school and smarts and doing well in school and why does it have to be uh, either a nerd or a slacker. You, either in, you, know, you either are a nerd or you don't care. Why do you have to have that choice? Why can't you just um, it'd be a different choice where you know, being, doing well in school is okay and is cool? Um, a conversation about violence in all forms of the media and uh, you know, its pervasive nature. Um, as boys get older, a conversation about sex and relationships and how the player image is uh, pervasive throughout <coughs> his media. And again, a conversation, and this is a tough conversation, but a really important conversation about male power and privilege, control and dominance, how that is, is reproduced and supported in the media and how that can be interrupted. And here's a couple of uh, quick examples of that. Um, you know, an example of male privilege uh, that comes through the media is that for boys, you know, if, as a boy I can choose from a variety of children's media featuring positive active heroes of my own sex and you know, they're, they're everywhere. Boys are everywhere, as I was saying. You know, you count the boy characters and um, they're, they're everywhere. The cost of that, however, is that, um, you know, most of these choices represent stereotypes that little, leave little room for my unique qualities. So, helping boys to understand that, that, that cost of privilege. Uh, another example of pri privilege, if I f fail, if I slack off and if I buck authority, that will be seen as cool and part of my adolescence and, you know, will, uh, may well be applauded by my peers. But the cost of that is I may not, you know, cost me academically, I may not get into college, I may not have the career I want if I, you know, choose slacking off or being cool as opposed to working hard. And one final example of privilege, you know, I can call the shots when I'm insulted, um, you know, seeking revenge will be seen as seeking justice and I'll be uh, justified in that. And again, we worry that some of this recent superhero uh, movies send that message. But there's a cost there that fighting doesn't teach me much Aggression tends to be get more aggression. You know, I might also get hurt. So, 
Um, that conversation, all those conversations about privilege and how those are, it's sort of that supporting the media are, are critical to have. Um, parents, teachers can encourage activism. I mentioned this this morning. Uh, some of you may have remembered this. Uh, Nova Scotia, several years ago, two boys in a school heard that, that another boy in their school was being teased, uh, being called gay, called a fag, uh, worse, because he was wearing a pink shirt, or he wore a pink shirt to school. And overnight, virtually, through their own media, email, text, Facebook, etc., they uh, organized a protest so that uh, hundreds of kids wore a pink shirt uh, to their school the next day to protest the, the bullying, the harassment that this kid um, suffered, and to say that, you know, this isn't happening in our school. And it caught on across Canada. There was a lot of attention in the media. It got some attention in the U.S. media, a lot of attention in Canadian media. So this, uh, from last February, uh, a poster from a Vancouver radio station. So Nova Scotia to Vancouver. Uh, pink shirt day, uh, let bullying stops here. There's a range of boys uh, and girls wearing their pink shirts to say, you know, we're not going to tolerate this. And it's a great example of, of you know, resisting the stereotypes, taking back the message, uh, you know, reclaiming what, what wearing pink means. You know, it's not uh, something to be teased about, but it's a, uh, something to, to be proud of. Um, we also talked about this this morning, that uh, there's, there's been a good bit of attention given to uh, groups of girls over the years, uh, girl cutting, complaining, uh, protesting against Abercrombie and Fitch until they recalled t-shirts emblazoned with slogans degrading, uh, demeaning to women. This one says, who needs brains when you have these? Another shirt says, available for parties. Abercrombie and Fitch, of course, markets t-shirts to boys. And uh, I've had some interesting conversations with folks about whether these t-shirts uh, are as degrading and demeaning and ought to be protested uh, in the same way that the girls' t-shirts are. They, they don't objectify girls in the same way, but they, uh, you know, they send a certain message about boys. Uh, they also, you know, put down moms. Uh, and so, you know, again, there's a place for a conversation, a place for a potential action on, on this kind of thing, which is, you know, very rare. The, 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 the action that typically happens in terms of media and gender is on girls' products. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting and great to, to have some action against boys' products? Um, just a quick plug for the Boys to Men organization in Portland. Um, they hold an annual conference for boys and uh, grown-ups in their lives. They also run a very effective uh, RSVP, Reducing Sexism and Violence program, which focuses on empowering both male and female students uh, in high schools to respond to uh, bullying, interpersonal violence and harassment, and media literacy and media activism are a central part of the program. Um, so that's happening there. And just a final note that through all of this, uh, you know, we were not as concerned, and we wouldn't suggest that you all be as concerned about the occasional sensational image or dramatic event, but the concern is really with the messages repeated over and over again, day in and day out, that affirm this kind of conventional, uh, limited sense of masculinity um, that uh, really are part of this sort of boys and girls living this popular, in the popular world. Uh, these messages silence other stories of masculinity that could be told, that real boys live. And so if we as parents, as teachers, as mentors, as coaches want to really create a better world, uh, to have an intention, uh, to, I mean, if, our, if culture consists of the intentional worlds we create, how do we create the world we want boys to live in and, and girls to live in as well, rather than the world created for them and for us by media and marketers? And, it's not easy, but um, you know there are some steps that can be taken. There are also some organizations already engaged in this work that um, encourage you to check out. There's a website for this book. There's a website for the companion book. Uh, the Boys to Men folks in uh, Portland are doing great work. The Hardy Girls and Healthy Women group uh, in Waterville are doing work on girls. Uh, there's several media education and advocacy groups 
the campaign for commercial free, child, free childhood is a great one that's doing um, lots of, they do a lot of activism and action around uh, the way in which uh, marketers exploit and, and send negative messages to girls. So, um, I'm going to shut up. We've got about 10 minutes for some questions or conversation and discussion. Uh, thanks very much for paying attention. I know it's getting stuffy in here, but if you need to sneak out, now's the time. And if there's questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them. And I also have this, uh, so maybe I'll just send this around. I don't know if I've got enough copies, but what should I just... So, are there questions? questions or comments or? Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> as a teacher, I was very much, very much on the nurture side of the scale. Yeah, yeah. And then I became a parent uh -huh. of a boy and a girl. Uh -huh. And I swung way over to the, the nature, nature side. Because there was just, you know, at 24 hours old, there were just such vast differences between these two beings yep. that were very much male and female differences, not just individual differences. <clears throat> and I read the book, The Wonder of Boys. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really pulled from that book was you can't expect your son to not be violent. You know, that... We have, evolved, we have evolved as hunters, mm -hmm. and although that's not the PC thing to be in our culture, boys, that men are hunters, and women birth babies. That's just fundamentally what we have evolved to do. So what I pulled from that book was, you can't expect your boy not to be violent, but instead, how do you direct that intense energy? So what I'm struggling with is, I have like a boy with capital B, mm -hmm. who doesn't watch TVs, his if media exposure is essentially none, he's only five. Yeah. So what I'm struggling with is, you know, so he, he picks up sticks and uses them as, as guns. He has been smashing things since he could pick something up and smash with it. So what do I do with that, like, we allow playing with guns, we talk about, I mean, we've talked about like, some people have guns, but you can't shoot people and why that's not okay. So, I, I mean, what are your, what's your take on, you know, that, you know, boy? So, well, I guess my question is, to what extent is this media creating violence in men compared to allowing an expression of violence in men? Like, instead of me just banning guns, saying, okay, let's make a gun out of wood, and this is what you can do with your gun, and this is what you can't do with your gun, why? Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's an ongoing conversation. Uh, you know, it's, I, I don't, we don't, you know, we don't have data that takes it one way or the other. I do, I would recommend, however, I was, I've been recommending this book wherever I go. There's a new book called Pink Brain, Blue Brain, which is by Lisa Elliott, which, um, he, she's a neuroscientist, and uh, it's written for parents, it's not written for neuroscientists, but uh, she really challenges uh, the folks who take a strong, uh, like the Wonder of Boys, Michael Gurian, takes a, who take a strong uh, biological argument. She says that, I mean, her evidence, and she goes through a lot of evidence, suggests that, you know, the, the biological differences, the genuine you know, the, the ones that can be documented, bio biological differences between boys and girls are very small. Uh, and, you know, she comes down on the side to say, even in terms of the way the brain reacts to uh, events in the world, you know, that that is, uh, you know, that the nurture, the socialization is a big part of it. So, um, I guess, I, I think the, the, certainly the, the jury is still out about this. Um, and I guess I, I would encourage you, number one, to kind of get a range of opinions about this. Um, I think no matter what, no matter whether, you know, violence is been socialized into men and boys or whether it's a native kind of uh, expression and, you know, the video games allow them to express that, you still need to talk about it. 
you know, and you still need to have a conversation about what it means, which it sounds like what you're doing. Um, and, you know, you can't, I don't think you can forbid it uh, fully. I don't think you can, you know, I don't think also it's a good idea to encourage it blindly and just assume, well, boys are being boys, my son's being a boy, and just let him do it, because it has consequences, right? It has consequences in the world, both literally and symbolically. So I think, you know, you have to have um, a conversation. I think it's worth certainly, you know, being aware as a parent about, you know, how, you know, all of us as grown-ups, you know, take these messages in and may kind of be reinforcing them. But, you know, I, it's, it sounds like, I mean, it's a challenge, I, you know, I, but I think you have to look for ways to begin to have that conversation. And I think as your son gets older, you, you know, I don't have any doubt that you will be able to have that conversation. And, um, you know, I, I just, I mean, I, I just don't uh, see there's any way around that as the solution rather than going on there. I don't know, that's maybe that's a wishy-washy answer, but no, that's a great, great question. And I, I just, I do think there's some other resources out there that are helpful as well. So, thanks. Yeah. Um, I had a question about uh, the future of this generation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, I think the problems are, you know, we continue to see problems. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I don't, th this generation isn't dramatically different. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I, I think the, the problems will, will continue. I mean, there's some uh, sense, as, as we were saying, that, you know, some of these messages are louder and more um, intense. So, you know, the, con the ongoing concern about risk taking and, you know, boys being more prone to take risks, the more prone to be injured. I think that's a concern. Um, the the gender differences in terms of alcohol use and abuse are, um, you know, continue to show, you know, boys, young men more prone to that. Um, you know, there's a concern about sexual violence, et cetera. Um, so I think all of those are concerns. I also do, however, think that, you know, there's hope. And I think that, um, you know, in the, generation in your generation I think there are folks there's an awareness a beginning awareness of some of this and and you know a kind of critical perspective on some of these stereotypes that I think are also uh, useful and I think you can look to the popularity of certain you know, media figures etc that really you know suggest that there are alternatives so you know I'm hopeful um, but I, I think we all all of us need to just kind of pay more attention to this um, and I, I don't easily predict, you know, great doom or, or you know, great uh, accomplishments, but I think, um, you know, there's cause for both hope and, and concern. Yeah. yeah. Um, looking at the, the title of the lecture, Helping Boys Resist Media Stereotypes, um, can you kind of rearrange that and say Helping Boys Resist Stereotypical Media? Ah. I feel like a lot of the media okay. that were shown in your yeah. lecture was stereotypical. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's yeah. Absolutely, you have a favorite non-stereotypical media you can. I, 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 sure, I, I don't know. This American Life. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. Make your own media. Make your own media. Yeah. Absolutely. That's yeah. Absolutely. One of the things that I we sometimes have a slide in is is encouraging boys to make their own media, girls to make their own media. Um, and that's a great way to do it, yeah. So, yeah, that, thank you. That's an interesting twist on that, and I think that's absolutely right. That, um, the, the, but I think we would say that the stereotypical media is the most pervasive, right? So, yeah, so we need to find ways to find that other stuff that's out there, and it is out there, um, to, and to encourage boys to consume that and to resist it. So thanks. That's a great, great point. Yeah. Um, this is more of a comment, I guess. Yeah. The question is, I think the thing I'm going to take example, yeah. the, the term slacker, right. I've heard boys use that, oh, I'm a slacker, right. and I right. sort of laugh and think I know what it means, right. but after today, I think I have a much better idea of what that means when they say that. Right. 
Um, and that's, I think, what I can do is be aware. Right. Um, well, and to talk to them. So, and ask right. them, so what do you, why do you say that about yourself? Right, and right. what does that mean? And, and, you know, not in a, I mean, again, you're thinking about that advice before, not in a judgmental way, but just, yeah. so, so tell me about what that means and where does that come from? What do you, yeah. you know, is that, why is that funny? And, you know, just to have a conversation right. about, because that's, that's an interesting notion and to find out, and it may, it certainly wouldn't be necessarily the same for all boys to say what that means about mm -hmm. myself, but they've picked that up, that right. term, Using it now to define themselves as a dimension of their identity, and so it's absolutely would be important to find out what they really mean by that, yeah. and you know, it's, and that increases their awareness because they're you're asking them to mm -hmm. you know think about it. It also helps you understand them. Right. So that's a great, yeah. yeah, great idea. Yeah. So I think you talked about how to get boys reading without perpetuating this male privilege you talked about, like having the main character in books be mostly. So have them read like books that have female characters. Yeah. I yeah. Guess, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. Anybody a reading teacher here? Who's you must be. Or folks in reading literacy. Um, yeah. I mean, what, well, that's a good question. Because I. Well, we're, we're, we're yeah. working on it. This yeah. is one of my students from my. Ah. Okay. So you. Oh. So I'm asking. Yeah. So, so so we've sort of come to listen to yeah. what do you think stereotypes would be yeah. in, in literature. Yeah. Um, and for instance, one of the websites we're looking at is something called Guys Read, right, right. which is put on by the National um, Young Person's Ambassador to Literature, John Sheska, right. who writes a lot of things with bombs and explosions and right. farts and burps, right. but boys read them. Right. Um, and certainly they can go outside of, out of, outside of that, and of course one of the ways we do it is we read books that have compelling characters. Right. Um, one of the most popular books in our collection is um, Notes from a Midnight Driver, which is about a boy struggling with his four-year-old brother's leukemia. Mm -hmm. However, um, I find that the books that boys will naturally gravitate towards um, are ones that have those characters that are advertised, um, superheroes um, that do have male protagonists, that do have action. Um, I mean, even if you looked at something like Harry Potter, right. very mainstream, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. boys and girls like it, yeah. but but does have that violence that grows and grows and grows with each with each book. Right. So right. so we have a full range, right. but it seems that perhaps because they're being told to read it, right. that's where they're channeling their their interest. Although I will also say that the, the Twilight series, right, which yeah. is more marketed towards girls, has an equal number of yeah, although we, I was talking to a book, uh, uh, of a bookstore who says that the, the boys sort of stand outside the door and have their moms buy the book for them. You know, so they, there is, again, they don't want to sort of be seen as buying this. But yeah, I mean, Twilight's an interesting example. I, I mean, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I'm, I mean, I think it's a great question. I think, I mean, there's, um, I should actually point you to an article. There's a really interesting study that was done uh, by some folks looking at uh, early home preparation for literacy among both boys and girls. Uh, and what they found was that from the very earliest, um, you know, in the toddler years, um, it looked to them like mothers and caregivers, particularly mothers though, because you know, primary caregivers, were making some assumptions about the reading preferences of their boys and versus the girls. And, you know, so it, it raised the question of, to me at least, and to these authors, um, about, you know, whether what we assume to be sort of, again, natural uh, proclivities for girls to be into, you know, more literate earlier and, you know, better readers earlier than boys were in fact, you know, again, influenced more more than we have assumed by you know decisions parents are making about time and the kind of conversations they have with their sons versus their daughters about reading so you know I, I mean the answer would be I think you start boys early on without any sense of you know shame or any sense that this is weird or this is different you know just reading a range of books and you start that in the home and you start that in um, you know, school, and you know, you, you find a way to, to do that, but also 
since that's not always, you know, we live in a wider culture, I think you also, you know, I would say you start as young as you can having a conversation with boys about the fact that you're only reading books like this and that's kind of reinforcing this. So you, you know, but it's a great question.